Hi guys, I'm going to do this ahead of time. I got a little sore throat coming back again, so I'm probably not going to be able to get by the screening tomorrow. So let's just get this done right now before, um, before my throat gets worse. Hopefully it won't get worse, but just in case. All right, um, it's pulmonary pathology, and I kind of messed up. So I usually do this lecture before I did the lecture on Tuesday. Um, it's got a little anatomy review in it. So we'll, we'll do this one today so I don't. So I make sure you get this. Plus we talk about interstitial fibrosis and some of the breath sounds. So let's do this one. Um, there is a full anatomy review that you can watch at this link uh, if you need it where I go into the weeds pretty pretty far on the pulmonary system. I'm going to do a little anatomy right now, though, uh, but not nearly as comprehensive as that video. But these are the lungs. This is what we're going to be studying uh, for the rest of this quarter. Uh, the trachea, of course, is here. And I, I talk a lot about the tracheal bronchial tree. This is the tracheal bronchial tree. It's the trachea. Um, and here's the divisions of the bronchi, which we'll look at, and it goes to bronchioles, and talk about them in a minute. And this tracheal bronchial tree is like the roots of a tree. The roots are embedded in the dirt, and you don't have dirt in your chest, but you do have lung tissue, and this lung tissue is kind of like the dirt. So this tracheal bronchial tree, and all these tubes are hollow, right? Air comes in and out of here. Um, this they're embedded in this dirt-like substance, and that's called the parenchyma of the lungs. And we talked about that, how important that parenchyma is. And it's it has a lot of elastic fibers, has collagen in it, it's made up of different types of cells. But the most important one is the collagen, which we will, well, I kind of already talked about that, how radial traction holds the really small tubes open. Um, just some general stuff. Um, we have the right lung, of course. There's three lobes to the right lung. There's the upper lobe, this middle lobe, and this lower lobe. On the left lung, we only have an upper and a lower lobe, uh, which is separated by an oblique fissure. The oblique fissure in the right lung separates the middle lobe from the lower lobe. So that's an easy board question. Make sure you don't miss things like that. There is also a horizontal fissure in the right lung that the left lung doesn't have. Um, so there's a middle lobe here that the right lung, or that the left lung doesn't have. Um, it kind of has a lingula, which is a remnant of the middle lobe, but that's kind of evolved out. The base is down here at the bottom. The apex is up here at the top. Supraclavicular fossas, uh, if you push right down deep into there, that's where the apex is. Okay. Um, and then the tracheal bronchial tree has many divisions, like any tree. Um, but the trachea starts up at the top, that's division zero. Uh, then we have the bronchi, or bronchus is singular, uh, bronchi is plural. Uh, the bronchi, there's three divisions. Uh, they break into the primary, secondary, and tertiary bronchi. AKAs for those are the are the uh, main stem bronchi or just the main bronchi. And did I write them down? Yeah, main bronchi. And then there's the lobar bronchi. And then there's the segmental bronchi. And the segmental bronchi, there's actually six divisions, which get smaller and smaller and smaller. And the seventh division is so small, um, it gets a new name, and that's called the bronchioles. Bronchioles. And they have five to 16 divisions. Everybody's a little bit different. Um, the, the key about these bigger pipes here, these kind of... They're, they're all conducting airways, but these are not the small airways, really. These are the larger airways. Um, they have a lot of collagen in, in cartilage or collagen material, which keeps them open. When you take a deep breath, this tube wants to collapse. 
and we can't have that, right? That would be like a beaver dam, and you wouldn't be able to get air in. Um, so what keeps them open is cartilage. Uh, when you get down to the bronchial division, there's no more cartilage. And we talked about how important the radial traction is, the, the strands of elastic fibers that connect to the outer portion keep these bronchioles open. And we talked about that a lot last time. Um, so just to draw um, a cartoon here, so the parenchyma of the lung has these elastic fibers that attach uh, right into the outer walls here. And this is what keeps them open. Okay, I'll just draw a couple of them here. And we talked about diseases that destroy this, these collagen fibers. And those affected, with, like COPD, those affected, especially emphysema, um, those affected, when they take a breath in, these collapse, and they have a lot of trouble breathing because of that. Okay? Um, then... The bronchioles, after anywhere from 5 to 16 divisions, smaller and smaller and smaller, they get more muscular and more muscular as they get smaller and smaller. And the very last division um, is called, and, and I'm sorry, it's not 5 to 16. There, there's, there's actually those divisions here. Um, so that's, um, that's what, about uh, 11 divisions? They get smaller and smaller? The smallest one is called the terminal bronchial. So you should definitely know that one. That is the last member of the conducting airways, the terminal bronchial. It's a nice board question. Okay. Um, then it goes down into a smaller tube called the respiratory bronchial. Uh, what's the difference between them? They both have smooth muscle in them. But this terminal bronchial has more smooth muscle in the walls of this little tube than anything else. It's almost like an arterial. Uh, but the respiratory bronchioles have something different. They have alveoli coming off. Not a lot of them, but they have a few alveoli. So you can exchange gas in these respiratory bronchioles. Uh, those break down into alveolar ducts, and alveolar ducts break down into individual groups of alveoli. Um, and those groups of alveoli live in alveolar sacs. Okay, these last three divisions, this is called the respiratory unit. The respiratory unit, and this is where respiration occurs. Right, we kind of said that last time, but there's a <clears throat> another review. All right, so everything I said about the bronchioles, um, they get smaller and smaller and smaller. They lose their hyaline cartilage or they finally lost all their hyaline cartilage. And at this point, um, they become bronchioles. Okay, those were bronchi. We already said all this stuff. Okay, more about the bronchioles. Um, I talked about and demonstrated the parenchyma of the lung has a lot of elastic fibers that connect. Um, and that is called radial traction. When those elastic fibers connect to the small, tiny airways and hold them open, that force that holds them open is called radial traction. Right, and I don't know if I showed you this before, but here's a real better drawing, probably better than what, what I drew it. Uh, but here's the, here's the elastic fibers here and the lung parenchyma holding this, this tube open. Okay, and diseases that destroy the lung parenchyma will also allow these cause these tubes to collapse, and that's why these people with emphysema, they can't breathe. One of the problems. Okay, we've already said they lost all their cartilage. Um, as they lose cartilage, the bronchioles gain smooth muscle, already said all that stuff. Um, what do they use all this smooth muscle for? Just like an arterial can, can contract and control blood pressure, um, these bronchioles can contract and and regulate the amount of air coming in and out of the respiratory unit. Um, histology slide. So the, the native tissue that lines the tube is pseudostratified columnar ciliated epithelium. And that cilia is very important, right? That's what sweeps all the gunk out that we inhale. Uh, forest fire smoke, pollution, Cigarette smoke you may walk into. Um, 
viruses, bacteria, all that stuff gets caught in the mucus escalator system. And so this tissue is very important. Uh, it also has a lot of goblet cells and mucus glands interspaced among um, all this epithelium. Just a fun fact, the columnar cells become more and more cuboidal looking as you get closer and closer to the terminal bronchioles. And that muc mucus escalator is called the mucoclearant or mucociliary clearance system is another probably more board-like word for it. And we said it's this, uh, it's made of those cilia and it traps inhaled particles, viruses, air debris, dead skin floating in the air, um, you name it. Um, it's made of four major components. Uh, there's two mucus layers. There's a thick mucus and there's a thin mucus. I'll show you a picture in a second. There's cilia and then there's the, the mucin producing cells, the goblet cells. Um, and mucus glands. Um, so here's the story here. Um, you, you pick a spot, any, any bronchial, um, any bronchus or bronchi will have this setup. Even the trachea has this setup. So here's the ciliated pseudostratified epith columnar epithelium. And here's the cilia. The cilia sweep together in harmony to sweep up toward the larynx. So we sweep the bugs and debris up toward the larynx where you can either swallow it or you can spit it out. Um, remember from physiology, though, that there's two, two kind of flavors of mucus. There is the sal layer, uh, which is, has a very high water content, so it's still sticky, but it's not crazy sticky. Um, it's thin enough that the hairs won't get stuck together. The cilia won't get stuck together as they're sweeping. And then on the top layer, there's not much water here. And this is like fly paper, very, very sticky. That's called the gel layer. Um, th these layers are both made up of mucin. Mucin is what creates this. And the amount of water that binds to the mucin water gives it the sol or gel layer appearance. A lot of water binds, sol layer. Not much water binds, super sticky gel layer. And together, that's the uh, mucociliary clearance system. And the cilia sweep this whole thing toward the larynx. Now, remember, for cystic fibrosis, we talked about CFTR channels. I don't think we talked about it really. Um, we talked about it in the GI system, but it's the same thing. There's C CR uh, CFTR channels that allow chloride. There are chloride anion channels, and they allow chloride to go up here into the lumen of the, uh, well, I forgot what we're using. Are we using the um, trachea or any of the tracheobronchial tree? Um, so chloride goes up. Water or sodium follows the chloride up, kind of like a puppy dog, to make sodium chloride. And water follows sodium up. So that's where the water comes from, right? People with cystic fibrosis have mutations in these CFTR channels, and you can't get chloride pumped from the interstitium and from these epithelial cells. You can't get that pumped into the lumen here, and therefore sodium doesn't follow, and therefore water doesn't follow, and therefore, you don't have a sow layer. And people with cystic fibrosis, they have two gel layers, and this doesn't work. And bugs can get in and invade the wall, and they multiply, and it's just a really uh, rough disease to have. Okay, we said the terminal bronchial is the smallest division of the bronchioles. Uh, very, very muscular, like an arterial uh, this is where asthma strikes. Asthma attacks really affect this, these terminal bronchioles because they have so much muscle, and it can completely close off the lumen. Um, and it can be fatal to some people having an asthma attack. There's no cartilage here either. They're completely held open by radial traction. Uh, there's these clara cells that are also um, held open in the terminal bronchioles. Um, what do they do? They secrete surfactant, which also helps, discourages these tiny tubules from sticking together um, after expiration is over. So it keeps them slippery so they won't stick together. So it's not all about radio traction at this level. Clara cells also happen. 
Respiratory unit we already talked about. Um, it's also called the asinor unit or the asini, respiratory asini. There's a whole bunch of AKAs, but it's those three amigos we talked about. That's where gas exchange occurs. O2 is put into the blood. CO2 is removed. Um, it's distal to the terminal bronchioles. Um, all of members of the respiratory unit have at least a few alveoli coming off them. Um, here is the respiratory unit. So it consists of a respiratory bronchial, which splits into smaller tubes called alveolar ducts. Alveolar ducts go to these clusters of alveoli, which are called alveolar sacs. Right? So, and we talked about this when we talked about um, COPD. We talked about how the walls of these sacs can be coalesced together uh, when inflammatory diseases wreck all these walls. And this alveolar sac gets huge and gigantic. Kind of nice view of the microcirculation of the lungs. I talk about that constantly, but here you can get a nice visual of this microcirculation. So these are L, uh, this is a venule, this is an arterial, and this is the capillary system around these alveoli. What did the artist do wrong on this drawing? I just noticed that. There should be alveoli coming off these respiratory bronchioles and the alveolar duct, so they forgot to draw those, but they should be in there. All right, here's the three amigos of the respiratory unit, respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, alveoli, or I could say alveolar sacs, which are groups of alveoli. All right, another concept is the pleura, just like the heart. We talked about the pericardium and the pericardial cavity. Uh, those are serous membranes. We also have serous membranes that line the thoracic cavity and wrap around the lungs, and those are called the pleura. Um, and just like with the serosa, we have a parietal pleura that is stuck to the chest wall. Uh, we have a visceral pleura that is stuck to the lungs, tissue itself, and the space in between there is called the pleural cavity. Pleural cavity. And it's a cero, uh, serosal type of, uh, of simple squamous type tissue, but it does secrete fluid. It's that serosal fluid. Or you could call it pleural fluid if you want. Uh, but it's serosal, just the same type of fluid that's around the heart, same type of fluid that's around all the intestines in the peritoneal cavity. Okay, so here's just a cartoon of the, the lungs. And this is exaggerated, of course, but this black layer, that's the, pre, that's the parent. Um, that is the parietal pleura that surrounds the chest cavity. Around the lungs is the visceral pleura. And the space in between is the pleural cavity. And that it contains a fluid that decreases any friction that might occur as these lungs are, are moving. All right, so that's pretty much the end of the anatomy review. Let's get into some clinical stuff now. You got to know these auscultory breath sounds. Let's talk about the breath sounds. Um, and they're heard with a stethoscope, of course. They're heard with a diaphragm. You'll never use the bell when auscultating for these. Always use the diaphragm. And the, you can hear the passage of air through this tracheobronchial tree. And it creates a, a classic set of sounds that we'll get into. And yeah, there are sounds where the gas molecules are rushing and scraping in across the walls of these tubes, and it creates sounds. And always use the diaphragm. And once you learn the normal sounds, then you have to learn the abnormal sounds, which are called adventitious sounds. Because sometimes, in addition to normal sounds, you hear these other sounds, and those are adventitious sounds, uh, which we will talk about. Um, these pathological sounds, um, they can be caused by obstruction of the lumen of the airway, by tumors, mucus plugs, um, choked, you, you aspirated something, a Lego for a little kid, uh, diseases of the parenchyma can do it, diseases of the pleura and chest wall. Um, these can all cause abnormal breath sounds. Let's meet the normal sounds first. So uh, vesicular sounds, that's the the most common sound heard over the lungs. Um, it's said to, it's kind of like Kentucky and Tennessee when we talked about the heart. 
the S3 and S4 heart sounds, the early scientists thought they it, it sounded like leaves rustling in a breeze. So I don't think it sounds like that at all, but um, that's what it's classically said to sound like. Um, it's a fairly low pitch sound, but it's not low enough to need uh, you to use the bell. You can still use the diaphragm with these things, and they're heard almost everywhere. Next, we have bronchiovesicular sounds, which are a little higher in pitch. They're said to be intermediate in pitch, um, and these are heard over the first and second intercostal spaces anteriorly, or the base of the heart, the clinical base of the heart. And they're heard where the rhomboid major muscles are, so between the scapula, or scapulae, plural, and spine. They're heard on the backside from T2 to T5. Let's look at a picture. Um, so here they are, second intercostal space. You can hear uh, a, it sounds like a vesicular sound, but it's a little bit higher in pitch. I mean, in reality, you probably need an electric stethoscope to, to make this sound out, and you have to practice this a lot. Uh, on the back side, they're right here between the rhomboids, so between the scapula and the spine. Next, go, even louder, even higher in pitch, are bronchial sounds. They're heard over the manubrium. So B here, they're heard right over the manubrium for the most part, still around the second intercostal space. Um, this is the bottom of the trachea where the carina is. Um, and a nice easy board question, Do you have bronchi can you auscultate bronchial sounds from the posterior? No, on the posterior side there's only vesicular sounds and bronchial vesicular sounds, so make a note card of that. What about the side? I didn't talk about the sides yet. That's vesicular sounds. Everywhere is vesicular, except the second intercostal space between the scapula. Even up here at the apices of the lungs, the traps up here, those are vesicular sounds as well. And then we have the highest pitch sound of all, tracheal sounds, which is, of course, over the trachea. Super, super loud sounds. Right, so those are the normal sounds, which you have to know, so make note cards of those. Now, here are the abnormal sounds. These are called adventitious sounds. So adventitious sounds are abnormal lung sounds. Now, McGee, book I really like, it's not a board book, but it's really evidence-based and very well referenced. Um, he goes on a rant about how ridiculous the naming system is of these things. I would have to agree with him on this. I mean, these were named back in the 1970s, and so and pro they probably need revision, but we all know how that goes. Um, so these are considered extra auscultory sounds because they're heard on top of your regular breath sounds. Um, they were created back in the 70s, 1977, to be exact, by the American Thoracic Society. And let's meet them. So here they are. There's only three of them. There's crackles, wheezes, ronchi. Make a note card. Memorize those. Um, quick, well, we're going to get into the weeds on each one of these, but just a quick kind of overview. Crackles, and I should mention the AKA here. Um, in uh, USA, in America, we use some older, older uh, pulmonologists still use the, wor the word rails. No one else in the world uses this world except here in America, maybe in Canada as well. So make sure you know that AKA. Everybody else calls them crackles. The AKA in the United States here is rails. Um, these are discon typically discontinuous sounds, meaning they're very short, like popping sounds, like Rice Krispies. Um, that's not always true, but it's usually true. So when they're short sounds, those are called discontinuous sounds less than 0.2 seconds in duration. Um, then we have wheezes. When you think wheeze, think asthma, an asthma attack. Asthmatics wheeze when an attack comes. Uh, these are much longer sounds, so they're, con they're continuous adventitious sounds. And then we have ronchi, which are also continuous sounds. But let's get into these a little more. Hit the rails, rails, trying to get rid of the word rails, but Old American physicians still use it, so watch out. It could be on board still. Crackles is the term. Um, crackles, we said, are typically discontinuous sounds. Um, they are. They often resemble mini little snap, crackle, and pop like Rice Krispies or Velcro pulling apart. 
Um, and not a Velcro that's brand new, but maybe a Velcro that is is uh, kind of been used and it's easier to pull apart. Uh, so, yeah, that's what they are. The key here of crackles, they're typically heard during inspiration. So when you breathe in, you get the crackles. Um, in severe disease, uh, they can be heard in expiration too, but typically it's an inspiratory sound. Um, it typically means there's a problem with the small airways, like the, the distal bronchioles, or the respiratory unit, and or the respiratory unit itself. You can make a distinction between early and late crackles. Early crackles would be just as you start to breathe in, you hear the snap, crackle, and pop. Late crackles is... You breathe in, and at the end of inspiration, they come. Okay, so those are early. Pan crackles, which are more rare, that's more of a continuous sound. You hear them in early and late inspiration. Just in general, this is, isn't 100% true, but in general, early crackles suggest diseases of the small airways, like the bronchioles and terminal bronchioles. Late or pan crackle suggest diseases of the respiratory unit itself, right? So I would make sure you know those distinctions. Uh, more associations, early crackles are typically heard in patients with COPD. We said last time COPD is a, a major heading that contains two subheadings, chronic bronchitis and emphysema and or chronic asthma. So early crackles are heard in COPD or chronic asthma patients. These late or pan-inspiratory crackles, um, they're typically heard in people with atelectasis, pneumonia, pulmonary edema, and pulmonary fibrosis. Make a note card, make sure you know that. Uh, what causes them? We don't know for sure. It's debatable. They used to think it was just fluid that has built up, and that that still is true, but it's not completely true. Interstitial fibrosis, which we're going to talk about in a minute, there is no fluid buildup in any of the tracheobronchial tree, yet that disease causes crackles like crazy. So it's something more than that. Yep, so one of the theories, again, secretion and fluids have collected in a collapsed airway and they tend to stick the airway together. And when you breathe, it's the, the air rushing in pops the airway open. But the airway is kind of held together by the sticky secretions that are in there. So it kind of snaps open is one of the, uh, one of the theories. Fun fact about crackles. Uh, this is not true of wheezes. The number of crackles heard has no relationship to the amount of fluid in the airway. Um, and we already said that interstitial fibrosis has the most crackles of any lung condition, and there's no fluid. This, can, this causes no fluid buildup in the lungs. Crackles are typically heard over the lower portion of the lungs where more fluid can pool. So costophrenic angles. What are they caused by? Pulmonary fibrosis, a.k.a. interstitial fibrosis, from conditions like uh, that destroy the parenchyma of the lung, like asbestosis, number one cause of crackles. And it has nothing to do with any fluid in the airway. Any disease that uh, causes a beaver dam inside the heart, like mitral valve stenosis, aortic stenosis, even regurgitation of the aortic and mitral valve, um, anything that raises the pressure uh, down toward the lungs uh, will cause pulmonary edema and or causes pulmonary hypertension, which causes pulmonary edema. We've talked to, talked about that a million times. Blood fluid can get into the alveoli and get into the respiratory unit and cause crackles. Myocardial infarction, that's going to cause a beaver dam in the heart uh, because if it's severe enough and the heart is defective and it starts not being able to pump blood good enough, you're going to get a backup of blood waiting to be processed by that diseased heart. And that backed up blood into the lungs is going to cause pulmonary edema. Um, pneumonia um, can, can do the trick as well. Um, and what else do I need to say? Not 
great likelihood ratio. That's a classic board favorite though, the ammonia, but really likelihood ratio is only two. I mean, it's, it's not, not very, none of these are great. Uh, uh, interstitial fibrosis is six, so that's not too bad. And these are positive likelihood ratios. So it just tells you how, how these symptoms, how predictive they are of, of crackles. Um, so, um, what is pulmonary fibrosis? We've been talking about that. Let's go down the pulmonary fibrosis rabbit hole. Oh my goodness, there's all kinds of AKAs for this. Uh, the big ones are pulmonary fibrosis, AKA interstitial fibrosis, interstitial lung disease, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. I'm going to use the big ones here. But make sure you know pulmonary fibrosis is an AKA for interstitial fibrosis. Um, this is, we talked about restrictive lung diseases. This is a member of the restrictive lung disease family. Prevalence is twice as common as Marfan syndrome, but it's still quite rare. Um, what causes it? Um, and it's a destruction of the parenchyma of the lungs, but we're not 100% sure what causes it. But we know what it does in the, the end phase of many different di disorders, I should back up. Pulmonary fibrosis is a giant category. Um, we said asbestosis is one called sarcoidosis. There's a bunch of different causes of pulmonary fibrosis, but they all result in destruction of the parenchyma of the lung, and then some. That's a terrible diagnosis. The five-year survival is only 20% because we don't have a great treatment for it. Um, it's possible it could be an autoimmune reaction to something, maybe cigarette smoke. We don't know. Um, but there is a fibroblast-heavy inflammation that occurs within the lung tissue. And, um, yeah, that affects the alveoli, the alveolar capillary system, and the adjacent parenchyma. Um, so you can get a, a beaver dam-like thing and this is one cause of core pulmonale or right heart failure, um, just like COPD, namely emphysema. It's kind of similar to emphysema in a way, but it is a little different. Um, yep, so this, these conditions that cause pulmonary fibrosis, part of the inflammation secretes type 1 collagen, which is a scar tissue, and that scars up the interstitium, makes it real stiff. It destroys elastic tissue. Um, so you can't, your airways can start to collapse, but the lungs get very stiff uh, and they can't expand very well. Yep, just like COPD, you can get destruction of the alveolar walls and the alveolar sacs, and those alveoli coalesce together, and that stretches out the alveolar sac. Um, so it's not as bad as is with emphysema, um, but it can create a whole bunch of dead air spaces. Not as big as emphysema. There's many, many little, little holes in the lungs, so to speak. This is the classic honeycomb lung, which we're going to look at here in a minute. I guess the minute is here. So, yeah, this destruction puts holes all over the lung tissue in the parenchyma of the lungs. So you got these holes, and it looks like a bee honeycomb system. So similar to emphysema. Um, people with pulmonary fibrosis typically don't develop the barrel chest um, like they do in, in emphysema. So that's a difference between them. Here's a honeycomb lung in someone who died from this disease. And you can see it looks like a bee honeycomb, like there's honey in here. And there's what it looks like on x-ray, so all kinds of trouble here. looks like the heart's got some fluid in it as well. It's a really big looking heart there. But you can see the little holes all over the place here in the lungs. I don't know if you guys have looked at enough chest films to know yet, but that's not normal looking. Um, how about some triggering events? Um, so maybe some theories are, are, are believe that allergens and antigens uh, can cause an autoimmune type reaction. Um, who are the allergens and antigens that can trigger this disease? Chronic exposure to occupational dust, asbestosis, for example, silicosis, for example, tobacco smoke. Um, this is the one that surprised me when I built this, uh, these, this lecture. Um, people who are choking 
uh, at night with acid reflux and it's getting down into the tracheobronchial tree. Um, that is one proposed mechanism of this disease. And sometimes you just can't figure out what causes it, so it's idiopathic. Maybe caused by some inflammatory diseases, some medications, so kind of mysterious. Um, and it's not common. We already said the prevalence is 0.02%. Typically affects adults in the late uh, or early middle ages. And uh, the most common complaint that these patients have is a progressive dyspnea. I used to be able to walk up this hill on our walk with my significant other, and I now I can't make it anymore. I, slowly, it's gotten worse and worse. Last year, I could make it three quarters of the way. I'm just out of breath. Um, this year, I can only make it a quarter of the way. That's a progressive dyspnea type thing. So it's getting harder and harder to do things without running out of air. And cyanosis, of course, occurs in the later phases of the disease. Uh, the honeycomb lungs, some more diagnostic findings. Honeycomb lung is classic. Um, you can have later panoscultory crackles. Remember we said this disease causes crackles more than any other disease. This disease also causes clubbing of the nails, which we talked about already. About 60% 60, about 60 of patients with pulmonary fibrosis have this clubbing of the nails. What's the treatment for? There's not a... I mean, you, this is a, you can't stop this disease. You can maybe slow it down. Uh, if you can figure out what the antigen or the allergen is, stop it. If you're working in a silicon factory, get out of there. Uh, if it's an asbestos factory, get out of there. If it's air pollution, if you're around cigarette smoke, if you're a smoker, stop. You need to avoid what, whatever's causing this inflammation. And then to calm down the immune system, corticosteroids, which are immunosuppressants. Did you guys know that? Um, corticosteroids are immunosuppressants. Classic one is prednisone. Um, oxygen therapy will be needed later in life. Uh, maybe even a lung transplant later in life. And sorry about the noise. I don't know if you can hear that. Our little neighbor has his little mini bike going around in circles out there. So. Wonderful. Usually it's the lawn people that get me, right, when I try to do this at home. Or the the maintenance people. Anyway, um, so wheezes. Remember I said when you think wheezes, your brain should immediately think of this picture, that she's having an asthma attack. So it's high-pitched. Uh, it's a musical note that's about 400 hertz, and it's almost always heard only in expiration unless it's really really severe so classically it's an expiratory musical note sound uh, you can google it and you can youtube it and you can hear examples of it um, and it's caused from acute airway narrowing so the pipes get so small it starts to create a little noise um, and the pipes can be narrowed by bronchial spasm of that smooth muscle especially in that terminal bronchial we said, which has more smooth muscle in the walls than anything. And yep, typically heard during expiration. Remember, crackles is usually an inspiratory sound. Wheezes is an expiratory sound. We'll talk about strider in a second. And if the blockage is severe, you might hear it in inspiration too, but it has to be like in the emergency room, like close to death. Uh, wheezes to get them in inspiration and expiration. And the longer that musical expiratory note is, the longer that note is, the more severe the obstruction is. So if your kid usually has a short little, when he's having an asthma attack, if he has a short little wheeze, not too bad. If the wheeze gets really, really long, that's concerning. Uh, that's a more significant degree of bronchial spasm. You better get them to the ER. Um, but the loudness of the wheezes has nothing to do with severity. It's the length of the wheeze that's more concerning. Uh, what causes the wheeze? Uh, we don't know for sure. It's possibly the, the narrowed walls vibrating off each other. They used to think it was like a resonance phenomenon, but that's not it anymore that's been disproven 
And uh, what causes the narrowing is that smooth muscle in the walls of the tracheobronchial tree. They constrict and they narrow. The more muscle, the more narrow those walls will get. So the terminal bronchioles are the target of this wheezing. Uh, what conditions can cause wheezing? I said, think asthma. Likelihood ratio is 6.0. COPD can also do it, but that's only like a positive likelihood ratio is about 3. Um, Strider is not a classic adventitious sound usually. It almost always occurs when a kid aspirates a small Lego or a piece of food and it gets stuck in the trachea or the carina or maybe a, the uh, maybe the right main stem bronchi. But it creates a beaver dam and that creates, as the, the air rushes over it, it creates a pitch also around 400 hertz. Well, wait a minute. That's what the wheezing pitch was. Um, yes, that's true. But the wheezes, wheezing is an expiratory sound. Strider is an inspiratory sound. So it only occurs during inspiration. So I'm going to test you on that. I'll tell you right now. So make sure you know the difference. Even though the musical note is the same, um, one, the... The asthmatics, they can't blow out. They can't blow out a birthday candle. It's an expiratory sound. Strider is an inspiratory sound. Then we have ronchi. This is the one they want to get rid of, rid of because it's typically um, on, heard in some patients who are seriously, seriously ill, close to death, and they don't have enough power uh, to even clear that mucus from their throat and it's the mucus in the tracheobronchial tree collecting um, and if you encourage them you can get them to uh, to clear that mucus it'll disappear so you could make this go away but ronchi it's called the death rattle it sounds like somebody snoring um, the pitch is lower it's 200 hertz or below um, and it's heard during expiration, so similar to wheezes, only it has a much lower pitch. Okay, and again, McGee and Egan, they, they want to get rid of this term. It's just too hard to tell apart from wheezing, and it's not really a, um, a disease in and of itself. It's because they can't clear their throats. Um, and yeah, if you clear the throats, you can get it to disappear. Uh, it's believed to be from mucus and fluid in the large airways seen in severely ill patients. And that's enough for today. Here's our bird of the day. This is the only time I've ever got one of these. This was a few weeks ago when I was just walking back from the Morgan Hill Ponds and flying right at me and overhead was this, this little falcon. Um, and that's called an American kestrel. And that is the smallest falcon in North America. And it's about the size of a blue jay. Maybe the size of a pigeon. This one looked a little bigger than a blue jay to me. But they say it's about the size of an average of a blue jay. So that is the American kestrel. Very cool little bird. All right. Hopefully I'll see you guys tomorrow. I'll see how my throat is doing. See if I can get past the security questions. All right, see you guys later.